Hello there, welcome to the Saroy channel, wherever you are in the world. And you're back to part three of our story, the final part of the story. And I'm so glad you've joined me tonight. If you haven't heard part one and part two, don't forget to click on the description. I do hope you're incredibly well and lots of love to each and every one of you. And don't forget to get yourself a lovely refreshing drink before I start my amazing story. And let's get started with part three of our story. I discovered I actually was thoroughly enjoying myself here at the cabin, and believe it or not, I was beginning to warm to my cousins. I went fishing with Eloise and her brother at the fishing pier, which was a little wobbly and unsteady, but we cast out our lines, and I managed to bring in a huge catfish that made Eloise and her brother's catches seem pitifully small and pathetic by contrast. I couldn't help noticing a shift in Curtis's mood when he witnessed my incredulous catch. He became quite short, crabby, tetchy, more than a little waspy towards me, and seemed incredibly aggrieved that I had caught a bigger fish than he had done. Even though he said, Well done, Elliot. I think you got lucky today, catching such a big fish for the first time. Call it beginner's luck. I could see that the smile was insincere on his face, and most certainly did not meet his dark, chocolate-coloured eyes. I realised that my irascible cousin had been afflicted with a touch of the green-eyed monster. There could be no mistaking how disenchanted and hangdog his expression had become, as he trailed rather despondently behind me and Eloise back to the cabin, carrying two small fish in his hands, while mine was the size of a small dog and seemed to weigh half a ton. I don't mind admitting I was puffed up with pride, when I returned to the cabin with my impressive trophy. Aunt Claudia made such a fuss about my illustrious catch, taking tons of photographs which she sent off to her sister, and Curtis looked more and more beleaguered, like a dark thundercloud, especially when his mother said, Oh, is that all you caught, Curtis? She patted him sympathetically on the back, in a consolatory way. Never mind, Curtis, better luck next time. Curtis's face burned the bright red colour of a field of poppies. He didn't enjoy being overshadowed by his little cousin, and was not a happy bunny if ever I saw one. My Aunt Claudia cooked the fish I'd caught for dinner, and I hasten to say it melted in our mouths like butter. I'd never tasted anything quite so delicious. Oh my God, said Eloise, stuffing a small new potato in her mouth with gusto. It was so hilarious, Mum, at the fishing pier. When Elliot caught the huge catfish, you should have seen Curtis's face. His eyes were almost popping out of his head. He was so jealous. I wasn't jealous, insisted Curtis. As I told Elliot here, it was just beginner's luck. Oh, please, Curtis, since when have you ever caught a fish that size? We've been coming to the cabin for years, and you have never, ever caught a fish like Elliot did. Curtis remained very quiet, far too quiet. But underneath the deep, dense layers of that foreboding silence, an ominous storm was brewing, one I never did see coming. But it would fortuitously soon make its inauspicious appearance known. For the time being, it remained masterfully buried behind Curtis's rather grim expression. I could perceive that his sister's teasing had ruffled his feathers ever so slightly and he was far from amused. But I think Eloise had hit the nail on the head. My cousin Curtis was burning with jealousy, trying desperately to hide it, but he wasn't fooling anyone, least of all me. I told you, sis, it was beginner's luck, he said gingerly, and for the record, I was not jealous of Elliot's catch today. If you must know, I'm proud of my little cousin here he said obsequiously, reaching out to pat me on the hand with a patronising gesture. On the last night we were staying at the cabin, I was more than a little surprised to find myself being woken up by Curtis in the middle of the night, in the early hours of the morning, when it was still rather dark outside. Over the last couple of days, Curtis had been especially nice to me and had redeemed himself considerably. I think he was secretly rather impressed by my fishing skills and the large catfish I had managed to procure. Could it be that he was no longer viewing me as his silly little immature cousin Elliot? But he was looking on me as an adult, his equal, 
taking me serious for once in his life. I was mature for my age. I felt so happy that Curtis was paying me so much attention. It made me feel grown up, important, and gave me a sense of belonging. In the past, I'd always felt like a fish out of water in the Hannon household. But finally, they were letting me in, welcoming me into their lives as a valuable member of the family. It was almost as if Curtis had become like a big brother to me. How could I have misjudged him so badly? I think he was quite a self-contained, polite person who kept himself to himself. Maybe I had misinterpreted his introverted personality as being aloof and indifferent. I had gotten him so wrong. Now here he was, waking me up in the middle of the night, eager to include me in a late-night adventure like this. He wouldn't be doing this if he didn't really, really like me, I thought, feeling my bumptiously cocky chest swell up with pride. I sat up in bed, wiping the sleep from my eyes. I groaned. I had been thoroughly enjoying my sleep. To be rudely awoken by Curtis like this was not something I fully appreciated. But then again, my big cousin paying me so much personal attention, well, it felt amazingly good. Elliot, my cousin whispered, it's our last night at the cabin. Well, in truth, it's early morning. It's just the sun hasn't risen yet. I thought we could go out onto the lake and enjoy watching the sun rise. What about it, bro? But it's dark, Curtis, I said, trembling, hoping my cousin hadn't seen my body beginning to quiver at the mere suggestion of going out on the water in the middle of the night like this. I didn't want Curtis to think I was a wuss or a great big baby, especially now when things between us were so good and he was viewing me so differently. I could feel a hollow develop in the pit of my stomach. It's dark out there. And you know, I can't swim. I mean, what if I fell into the lake? My cousin's lips twitched, as if there was a flicker of a smile developing on his face that he tried to suppress, but not very well. He physically stiffened and studied me quizzically through his dark brown eyes that almost looked a little cold. Elliot, he said, you know I've got your back. Besides, the boat is perfectly safe. You've no idea how wonderful it is to be out on the lake at night, staring up at the stars. There's nothing like it in the whole world. And the best moment is when the sun rises and it breaks over the water. It's transfixing. It really is. Do you really want to miss out on all this fun because of a silly little pet fear you have over the water? It's no different going out on the water at night as it is during the day. Only a zillion times better, I can promise you of that. I especially asked you to come with me, Elliot, because I like you a lot. There is no way I was ever going to ask Eloise to join us. Can you imagine? She'd be moaning like a mini if I tried to get her out of bed. Curtis's humorous comments made me smile. I knew how cantankerously belligerent Eloise could be at the best of times. You're not like her, Elliot. You're like a little brother to me. And going out on the lake like this is what brothers do, don't you think? I didn't know about what brothers did or did not do together. I was a single child, after all. But what I did know was that it felt remarkably good to have my older cousin confiding in me. It was wonderful that for the first time in my life he was taking me seriously. So reluctantly I agreed to go out on the lake with him. I wanted to nurture this friendship between us that was blossoming like the dogwood trees in spring. I hurriedly climbed out of bed, abandoning my pyjamas in a puddle on the floor. I put on a pair of long khaki pants, some sneakers, a sweater, and a thin windbreaker. It was early spring, so the nights and mornings were still quite chilly, and out there on the lake, with a sharp drop in temperature, it was bound to be quite cold. I stealthily followed Curtis through the cabin, like a furtive cat. He placed his fingers on his mouth, indicating for me to be very quiet. But the rebellious wooden floorboards seemed eager to betray our presence, as they belligerently creaked and groaned, as if walking on their very surfaces caused them considerable pain. We were now standing close to Aunt Claudia's bedroom. We had to be very quiet at this point. I could tell she was fast asleep. I could hear her soft breathing. I nearly jumped out of my skin when Rochester began to bark and bark and bark. I was certain the game was up. 
but Aunt Claudia would get up out of bed and give us our marching orders, insisting we return to bed at once. And what the hell did we mean by sneaking around the cabin at this ungodly hour of the night? I stood very still on the floor, not daring to move. Please be quiet, Rochester, moaned my aunt. I'm trying to sleep. Rochester, who clung on to my aunt like a limpet, on hearing her sharp, reprimanding tone of voice, obediently stopped barking, stretching out his paws lackadaisically, and watching us rather suspiciously through his dark eyes, as we tiptoed past my aunt's bedroom. Everything was very dark in the cabin, but with our head torches on, we could see our way clearly. Once we were outside, my heart that had been pumping a dime to a dozen began to finally slow down. I physically began to relax. I was surprised that I no longer felt apprehensive about this nightly adventure. It was exciting being out here at this time of night, under the twinkling canopy of the bright stars that reminded me of rhinestone jewels set in an opulent velvety evening gown. The moon hung low in the sky, reflecting her silvery prisms across the lake's shimmering surface. Before long, there we were out on the lake in the rowing boat. It was so beguilingly beautiful, so peacefully tranquil. The air was crisp, sharp, and very cool. A fresh breeze spurted itself across the water, nuzzling our cheeks and whipping against our windbreakers. I could hear the pleasing trills of the crickets and frogs, and the sweet sound of the lake's water lapping against our boat. It was a snug, cosy feeling, being out here on the boat with my cousin at this crazy time, while the rest of the world remained obliviously fast asleep. See, I told you, said Curtis proudly. I bet you're glad you came out with me tonight. Does it get better than this? Of course it doesn't. Now we can sit back on the boat, watching the Milky Way, waiting for the sun to rise over the horizon. And it's stunning. There's nothing like it. I had to agree wholeheartedly with my cousin. It was thrilling to be out here in the middle of the water like this, on a boat, staring up in awe at all the constellations. I felt so remarkably privileged that Curtis had included me on this wild, wonderful opportunity that I would unlikely get to repeat again, unless, of course, I was terribly lucky. We had come a long way in our friendship, in what I considered to be leaps and bounds over the last couple of days since I'd come to the cabin. In the past, Curtis had never been terribly friendly towards me. But on this night, spent out here on the boat together, was firmly cementing our friendship still further. I was so glad I'd agreed to come on this serendipitous nightly jaunt. As I was reflecting over this, all of a sudden, I had an overwhelming feeling we were not alone. It was so disturbing that I found myself scrutinising the shoreline from the banks of reeds to the lofty silhouettes of the trees, with their voluptuous boughs that hovered over the lake, like bent woman, reaching out for seashells. This was when I saw the tall, dark figure, with the bright yellow eyes. For a moment, I thought I was dreaming. I had to be. The ambiguously obscure figure stood there staring at us for a brief moment, and then disappeared through the trees. Its outline was so vague, so indistinct, so obscure, that I couldn't comprehend exactly what it was that I'd seen. In truth, I was so nonplussed, bewildered, completely confounded, too much so to actually react. Curtis, who had been rambling on about all the constellations, had been oblivious to the fact that I had not heard a single word he'd been saying. All I could hear was him talking about the Pallades, and then about Orion, I think it was. I was surprised my cousin had not sensed that something had been watching us. Was he really that unobservant? That removed from his environment? Because someone had been watching us, and he didn't appear to have noticed a single thing. "'What is wrong with you, Elliot?' my cousin asked me, looking perturbed. "'You've gone as white as a ghost.' "'It's just something out there, on the shore. It, it was watching us. I, I saw it. It had yellow eyes. It was big, very big.' I trembled as I visually recalled in my mind what I'd actually seen. Curtis began to steadily laugh. <laughs> "'Do you really think we're alone out here on the lake, Elliot?' You can't be that dim, surely. Mark my words, we're being watched all the time. The indigenous wildlife probably knows we're here. They watch us from a distance. How do you think they manage to survive? They need to be very sharp. So I guess we might have been observed, 
by all kinds of things, raccoons, owls, foxes, deer. God only knows what has been watching us. My cousin's words brought me a huge measure of reassurance. He was right, absolutely right. We were being watched by the natural indigenous wildlife that congregated in the woods. There was nothing to be afraid of. Look over there, said Curtis. Don't you see it over there? Did you see it? It was jumping out of the water. My cousin was pointing in a westerly direction over the lake. He was enthused and animated, as if he'd seen something incredibly wonderful. I found myself growing excited. I was eager to see what he'd seen, but I couldn't see anything at all. Maybe I was looking in the wrong direction. Where? I asked. Over there, said Elliot. I was leaning over the boat to inspect the water, intrigued by what Elliot said he had seen. And then I felt a hand on my back, and a sharp push, and then I was being plunged into the water. It was dark and cold. I found myself in the water, kicking my arms and legs around frantically, desperately trying to get back to the boat. Curtis was standing there on the boat, with a huge satisfactory smirk on his face. He was enjoying my terror as I fought against the water and tried to swim back to the boat, but I didn't know how to swim. This couldn't be happening to me. Why had Curtis pushed me in the water like that? I thought he liked me. I thought I could trust him. There was no doubt in my mind, judging by the malevolent expression on Curtis's face, that he had deliberately pushed me into the water. You're going to have to learn to swim, aren't you, cousin? All on your own, Sim. Because no one can save you now, can they? And for the record, don't think you're such a big shot catching a big catfish like you did the other day. I've caught much bigger fish than that, despite what Eloise might tell you. Good luck, cousin, out there in the dark water, all on your own. You're going to need it. Curtis began rowing the boat to shore, while I was struggling desperately to keep my head above water. If Curtis had thrown a little puppy in the middle of the lake, why had it not occurred to me that he might do the very same thing to me? My cousin did not care about me remotely. He had ruthlessly abandoned me. I was going to die out here. I was swallowing large gulps of water. It was exhausting trying to keep my head above the surface. The water was cold. It pinched right through me. I was beginning to freeze, but a tiredness was consuming me and the panic had completely expunged my ability to actually even try to swim. I felt hopelessly defeated by the water. My heavily burdened fear expunged all my hope, and overcame my instinctive ability to try and fight back. My thunderous heartbeats were so loud, I could hear the blood throbbing in my ears. I grew more and more exhausted. The desire to get back to shore was overcome by an insatiable fatigue. I knew I was about to be swallowed whole by the lake, but I didn't care any more. I was just too tired to keep on fighting. I became weaker and weaker and weaker, and felt myself slipping under the surface of the water. And very suddenly, as I was about to surrender my soul to the water, a very large hand began to pull me up to the surface. I began to fight back with my plummeting energy. This was just like my nightmare I'd experienced in the early years of my life. The hand that would drag me under to my watery grave. The hand I'd regarded so bodefully in my dreams. But this hand did not pull me under. It pulled me out of the water and placed me onto a pair of ponderous shoulders. And this huge hairy thing, like a gargantuan otter, swam with me through the water to the edge of the shore. I was so dog-tired, exhausted, impoverished and drained of all my energy. I collapsed on the shore, gasping for breath. A large, generous hand pressed down on my chest, helping me to expel some of the water I'd swallowed. I began to cough, splutter and heave. And that was when I found myself staring into the dark, treacle-coloured eyes of a male Bigfoot. I realised that this ambiguous creature, with a yellow eye shine, who had stood there under the canopy of the stars, watching me and Curtis row the boat in the middle of the lake, was the one I'd seen only earlier on. I wondered what he was thinking when he watched us. Had he seen Curtis throw me into the water? Is that why he'd come to my rescue? This clearly benevolent Bigfoot was gargantuan in size, very impressive, easily nine foot tall, possibly more. 
with ponderously powerful shoulders and a nimble gait. When he climbed out of the water, he shook his hair vigorously like a shaggy dog. I think the thing that confounded me the most was how human the Bigfoot was. His primate influences could only be seen in his overlong arms, the pyramid shape of his head, and his hair-covered body. The moonlight was magnanimous. I could absorb every detail of the creature's appearance like a thirsty sponge. I knew the Bigfoot was a male before even studying his anatomy. It was just his warrior energy was so masculine, so powerful, so incredibly reassuring. I felt safe in his presence. The creature was studying me curiously, as if reading me like a book. He scratched his head pensively for a moment, and then he spoke to me in a booming voice that was so impressive that I nearly jumped out of my skin. However, I was about to be even more bewildered when the Bigfoot's words melted into my mind like chocolate, and I discovered to my amazement that I knew exactly what he was saying. Manatinatola! Are you all right? he asked me. I'm fine, I said, a little shocked. I was still shivering from the cold, and my hair and clothes were soaked to the skin. You cannot swim, I see. Your friend pushed you into the water, leaving you to die. How could he do this despicable thing to you? He did that to the puppy dog a while back, which I had to rescue. The poor thing was frightened out of its skin. That boy is not right in the head. His umbalanana is misaligned. I need to sort him out. I was still so numb from everything that had just transpired. I couldn't make sense of any of it. The Bigfoot threw me on his shoulders and took me straight back to my aunt's cabin. I remember bolting into my aunt's bedroom as fast as I could. Rochester bounced off the bed and began to bark at me, and bark and bark, as if he had no clue who I was. It was like he didn't recognise me, even though I'm sure he could have smelt me. As a result of Rochester's barking, my aunt sat up, bolt upright in bed, and in the tenebrific dark shadows of the night, my bedraggled figure, with my damp clothes clinging to my body, and the pooling puddles of water in the middle of her bedroom floor. Well, I must have looked like a spectral form of some kind, from which your darkest nightmares are possibly made of. My aunt let out such a loud, discomposing scream. Eloise came dashing into the bedroom, with a fire poker in her hand. What's going on? What's going on? She cried. I think she thought we were being burgled, and was about to bludgeon the unsuspecting criminal to death with a mighty blow. Her hands were trembling, her face ashen, her eyes as round as saucers. My aunt's eyes began to adjust to the dark shadows. She held up her hand towards Eloise, to stop her from doing anything stupid. She suddenly realised it was me standing in the middle of the floor. Little Rochester was seated on the floor on his backside, looking up at me. His barking had stopped. He realised who I was. My God, Elliot! Is that you? You're soaked to the skin, said my Aunt Claudia. What the hell happened to you? Me and Curtis. We went for a row in the boat in the middle of the night. It was Curtis's idea, you see. But he pushed me into the water. He left me to drown, Aunt Claudia. My aunt was outraged. I do not think I have ever seen a woman look more angry. Her face went as white as a sheet. I will kill Curtis when I see him. What is wrong with that boy? What did he do that for? Pushing you into the water like that? You could have drowned. My aunt began bustling around the place, getting me dry clothes to wear, rustling up some hot chocolate for me to drink. I think she believed that Curtis was stealthily hiding in the shadows, waiting for my aunt's rage to die down before he made his appearance known. My aunt was grinding her teeth and growling under her breath. I'm going to kill Curtis, she kept saying over and over again. I'm going to kill him. By the time I've finished with him, he'll wish to God he'd never been born. It was hours later 
when Curtis had still not returned to the cabin, that my aunt's anger morphed into grievous concern. She now began to believe that something quite terrible might have happened to Curtis. I had not told her about the Bigfoot I'd encountered, not because I was deliberately keeping invaluable information from her, or because I was being evasive, but because the extraordinary events of the previous night had been so surreal. I was still trying to process them all in my head. Then I remembered the Bigfoot's ominous words. Had he not said something about sorting Curtis out, as he wasn't right in the head? My heart began to pound in my chest. I wondered if the Bigfoot may have harmed Elliot, in retaliation for cruelly throwing me in the lake, leaving me to drown. My Aunt Claudia was under the misleading impression that little Rochester had managed to safely swim to shore when he was a little puppy. She also believed I had swum to shore on my own. But she was wrong about both accounts. We would likely have drowned if it hadn't been for being rescued by a Bigfoot. Had the Bigfoot decided to do away with my cousin? Me and my aunt and my cousin Eloise went marching frantically through the woodgrove, calling out Curtis's name. We found one of his shoes lying in the grass, and my aunt began to panic. She thought he might have been attacked by a wild animal. We knew he hadn't drowned in the lake, as the boat was safely parked in the boathouse. But a lone shoe lying in the woods like this was an unsettling sight indeed, one we did not want to encounter. We continued to call for Curtis, fearing the very worst and hoping for the best. But to no avail, Curtis did not appear to respond to our calls. The time we spent searching for him seemed to melt away as quickly as marshmallows over a campfire. Where the hell was he? My aunt's voice was filled with trepidation. She cried out Curtis's name until she was hoarse, but there was no sight or sound of him. Curtis! 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 And just as we were about to give up all hope, there he was, walking nonchalantly through the woods, which I hasten to say we had so thoroughly searched. Where had he been? And why did he look so befuddled, as if he didn't have a clue where he was, and was somehow concussed? rather like someone coming around from a long anaesthetic after an operation. I studied his face closely, for any sign of duplicity. A lingering smirk, perhaps, a twitching at the corners of his mouth, a mischievous look in his eyes, but all I saw in his face was disorientated confusion. I thought, what the hell? There was something profoundly different about my cousin, startlingly so, which was hard to pinpoint exactly. It was a bit like putting a black sweater into the washing machine, and you put it on for a full cycle, and when you remove it, it's completely turned white. You know it's exactly the same sweater, but it has been radically altered. Curtis was like that. He looked confused as he stumbled towards us, with one foot in his shoe, while the other foot remained in a sock. It was hardly a wonder he couldn't walk straight. He was covered in leaves and looked like he'd taken a nasty fall. There were big holes in the fabric of his chinos, and his knees were badly grazed. "'Where the hell have you been, Curtis?' asked Aunt Claudia. Her expression wavered from one of indignant fury to incredible relief, almost like she wanted to hug her son and kill him at the very same time. "'What am I doing here? Why am I in the woods? And why are there holes in my chinos? Sweetheart, that's what I'd like to know. We've been worried sick about you.' looking for you everywhere. I'd like you to explain yourself. Why the hell did you throw your cousin Elliot here into the lake in the early hours of this morning? What were you thinking, going out rowing in the lake anyway? And why did you do it? You knew he couldn't swim. He could have drowned, Curtis. That is so irresponsible of you. Curtis looked discombobulated, as if he'd been knocked sideways. I knew by his stupefied, rather bamboozled expression. He had absolutely no memory of what he'd done, and seemed mortified that he'd throw me into the lake. Was he acting, I wondered? If he was, he deserved an Academy Award, for he genuinely seemed very cut up about what he'd done. I didn't, did I? I wouldn't, would I? You did! But Elliot can't swim! Why would I throw him into the lake? I studied my cousin's face very closely, for any sign of duplicity. But honestly, there was none. He genuinely had no memory of shoving me into the lake, and no memory of what had transpired in the woodgrove. It upset him that he couldn't remember a thing. 
The only thing he seemed to remember was the evening meal the night before. Another curious conundrum that happened that afternoon, soon after we found Curtis, was that the Jack Russell Rochester, who refused to go anywhere near Curtis, trotted up to my cousin and began to pour at his feet, as if he was saying, Hello, I'm glad you're back, safe and well. That had never, ever happened before. It confounded all of us. Curtis began to stroke Rochester lovingly, to tickle his tummy for him, while my aunt's eyes grew wide with amazement. She could make no sense of Rochester's behaviour. It was absurd for the dog to be given Curtis so much attention. This had never happened before. My aunt thought Curtis might be delirious. I think he hit his head, she told me. That's why he can't remember a thing. I can hardly reprimand him for something he doesn't remember doing. But why is he so different, Mum? asked Eloise. It's like my brother has had a complete personality transplant. It's like a darkness in him has suddenly left, don't you think? Claudia's account. I cannot describe to you how mortified I was to wake up in the early hours of the morning to discover my sister's son, Elliot, standing in the middle of the floor, shivering with cold, in soaking wet clothes, having been alerted to his presence by my dog's barks. I thought I was seeing a ghost as the cabin was dark and I was unable to see much in my bedroom, but what I saw gave me the shock of my life until, of course, I realised it actually was Elliot. When Elliot told me that Curtis had thrown him into the lake, my worst fears were soon realised. It took me straight back to his childhood, when he had locked Felicity van Riesen in the yard shed at kindergarten. I had known, even as a teenager, that my son had a secret dark side to his personality. It had never gone away, but had remained hidden, and his medications had suppressed his desire to pull any more insidious pranks on his friends and family. I tried to pretend it was not there, but as I had sneakily suspected, it had come back to bite me, as I knew it ultimately would. My son could have killed little Elliot by leaving him to drown in that huge lake. And like Rochester, it was a complete miracle that somehow he'd managed to be able to swim to shore. But next time, and there just could not be a next time, things might go horribly awry. I could not imagine how my sister Beryl would have reacted if I told her her son had drowned in that lake. She might not speak to her husband Rusty from time to time, but if her son had drowned in that lake, she'd never have spoken to me ever again, and that I knew. So as soon as I got home, I had to send Curtis for further psychological evaluations, as what had transpired just could never happen again. How would I live with myself if my son was responsible for harming another human being, let alone another member of his own family? I cannot express to you the level of indignation I felt towards him. I had visions of throttling him so hard with an inch of his life for his callous attitude towards his cousin. How could he have been so insanely cruel? When Curtis did not make an appearance for several hours, I suspected he knew he was in the dog box and was keeping a safe distance from me until my inflamed anger had cooled down. But later Curtis still had not shown up and many hours had gone by by then. We were supposed to be returning home that afternoon, so my anger was transformed into worry, like water to steam. Something dreadful must have happened to my son, but what? I searched the entire woodgrove for him and the meadows, but he was nowhere to be found. I noticed the boat was in the boathouse, so he couldn't have fallen into the lake, but then where was he? When I discovered one of my son's sweaters tangled up in some briars, and his head torch smashed to the ground and a lone shoe lying in the grass. Like any doting parent, I began to fear the very worst. Had my son been attacked by a wild animal? When I was about to call for reinforcements to search for my son, then he made an appearance, and he emerged from the woodgrove as if he'd come around from a heavily drugged state. He was disorientated, muddled, rather confused, and had no apparent memory of the entire day. I had been in the woodgrove earlier and seen no sight or sound of him, and now here he was. Where had he been? It was very enigmatic for me. For as long as Curtis had been a teenager, he'd always been impeccably dressed. But as he came out of the woods with his hair so tousled, covered in leaves, and he had round holes in the knees of his chinos and grazers on his knees, 
as if he had taken a nasty tumble. I wondered whether he'd hit his head really badly, and completely lost his memory. But when my son came out of the woodgrove, there was a sweetness to his personality that I'd never seen before. My Jack Russell, always avoided Curtis, began to behave differently towards my son, and my son in turn exhibited a tenderness towards the dog, a tenderness that I'd never seen before. He appeared to have undergone some kind of character transformation. As we packed to go home, I climbed back in my truck, and my car rolled speedily down the driveway, and that was when I saw him. A hairy, tall, dark, ambiguous silhouette was standing there, blocking my way. I almost had a panic attack, on the spot, as what I was beholding was quite possibly the most scary thing I'd ever seen in my entire life. It was a Herculean-sized Bigfoot. I thought my heart was going to stop as the creature began to wave us down. That's my friend, Auntie Claudia. He won't hurt you. He's really, really nice. He's the Bigfoot that rescued me from the lake because I couldn't swim and he told me he rescued Rochester when Rochester was a puppy. I stopped my car. My heart jumped into my throat. My breathing was fast and furious. This powerful, lofty, majestic creature was so imposing, so daunting, so completely intimidating. To my amazement, he ran over to my driver's side door and tapped on the window with his sausage-sized fingers. It was then that I observed the creature's human-like face and genuinely concerned eyes that were both benevolent and kind. So I rolled down my window. The Bigfoot placed something rather curious in my hands. I wondered what it was. It looked to be a strained leather necklace with an eagle's feather attached to it. The Bigfoot pointed to my son, speaking in a strange language, with its meaning curiously downloaded into my head, so that I understood exactly what he was saying. I mean, how does that happen? I fixed his head for you. It was out of alignment. He needs to wear the eagle feather for the rest of the week. The dark energy will not come back. I have commanded it to go. Bad energy removed. Not his fault. Your son, good boy. Bad energy, now fixed. And with that, the Bigfoot simply turned around, glided away, swinging his arms backwards and forwards, and moving straight into the trees until he had all but gone. Eloise was sitting in the truck next to me, her mouth hanging open like a Venus flytrap. Oh my God! Oh my God! Tell me I'm dreaming! Did that just happen? Oh my word! Oh, that was a big foot! It was a big foot! Wait until I tell my friends about this. They are not going to believe it! To cut a long story short, my son Curtis has no memory of what happened to him in the woodgrove shortly after he pushed Elliot in the lake. Nor does he remember how he got into the woodgrove in the first place, or why we could never find him. But something did happen to him to deliver him from the psychopathic tendencies he'd always exhibited, and I believe it was a Bigfoot who helped him overcome those issues of his. Suffice to say, I made him wear that eagle's feather that the Bigfoot gave us, and when my son returned to his psychologist, all his medications were removed. He was diagnosed as being a perfectly normal, healthy young man. It would seem little Rochester had found for himself a new best friend. Elliot continues to be a loving member of my family, and Eloise, although she's still hot-headed, has calmed down significantly, but some things remain unchanged. My sister Beryl and her husband Rusty still engage in their silent wars from time to time, and my sister's Beryl's spending has not been tamed at all, so some things just will never change. There you are. That's my story. Wow, what an incredible story. Until next time, goodbye and good night.